Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a privilege to speak to a, such a distinguished audience, especially since agriculture is not my background. And I'm particularly grateful to Professor Ramagosa and the organizers for this invitation. I have prepared this presentation with my two colleagues, Dr. Bala and Dr. Balaji, who do have a background in agriculture. But first, let me say a word about my organization, the Commonwealth of Learning or CALL, which is an intergovernmental organization established by Commonwealth heads of government. And CALL believes that access to learning is the key to sustainable development. We have the mandate to work across the Commonwealth, which is a diverse association of 53 member states covering all regions of the globe, and all the yellows you see are the Commonwealth countries, starting from Canada, the Caribbean, which you can hardly see, Africa, Asia, and the Pacific. And out of these 53 member states, 43, 46 are developing countries, so you will see that that's where my perspective comes from. Our mission is to help member states and institutions to harness the potential of distance learning and technologies for expanding access to education and training. Our headquarters are in Vancouver, Canada, with a regional office for Asia in New Delhi, India. I was asked to speak about non-traditional models and I will first look very briefly at the global context, since this was discussed quite thoroughly yesterday. Review the growth of agriculture higher education in the developing world. I will then consider the various options of non-traditional modes that have emerged as a response to the growing demand for higher learning. In the last five decades, we have seen the emergence of four major models, distance education, online learning, open education resources, or OER, and MOOCs. In conclusion, I will suggest how these innovations can be harnessed by the agricultural higher education community to provide the relevant knowledge and skills to our learners, particularly the youth, to deal with the requirements of the 21st century. But first, the global context. We've talked about this yesterday. The world population is growing exponentially. And according to IFAD, there are 900 million hungry people today and 1.4 billion people who live in extreme poverty, which is less than $1.25 a day. There are 1.2 billion young people between the ages of 15 to 24, which is a UNESCO definition of what constitutes youth, most of them in developing countries. There is a high rate of unemployment, especially among young people. And yesterday we spoke of how they can be attracted to agriculture as a livelihoods opportunity. And we spoke mostly of curriculum reform. Now, in spite of the critical role that agriculture has, the trend has been a decline in terms of its contribution to the GDP. The biggest slump can be seen in South Asia, which pioneered the Green Revolution in the 1960s. Uh, it shows that we need more human resource development, which is very clear. But the investments seem to be decreasing substantially, and according to FAO, and I quote, between 2001 and 2012, the average national share of government expenditures on agriculture forestry and fishing fell from 3% of total government expenditures to just over 2%. As IFAD states, the food production needs to be doubled by 2050 in developing countries to assure food security. Equally important is the fact that GDP growth generated by agriculture is up to four times more effective in reducing poverty than growth generated by other sectors. So how do we achieve these objectives and what role does education have to play? Agricultural higher education in developing countries was introduced in colonial times. The traditional style of indigenous education was transformed into an institutional form 
which provided a link between primary, secondary, and tertiary education through schools, colleges, training institutions, and universities. The brick and mortar didactic mode of education began during the 19th century in many developing countries as an important tool for economic growth and social development. Many Asian and Latin American countries witnessed a growth in higher education and agriculture during the 19th and early 20th centuries. On the Indian subcontinent, departments for agriculture can be traced back to the 19th century, which led to the establishment of agriculture and veterinary colleges. By contrast, Africa made a late start. Post-secondary education in agriculture bega began in Makarere University, Uganda, as a certificate course in 1924, and it was not until the 1960s that the large-scale development of agricultural higher education took place in Africa. The Green Revolution in Asia played a key role in the establishment of new agricultural universities, which were campus-based, based on the land-grant model of the US, and not designed for very large numbers. You might say, yes, they were designed, but you'll find out when I talk about open universities, uh, that relatively the numbers were small. On the other hand, as Bloom et al. point out, the development of tertiary education in Africa was neglected due to the belief of the international development community that primary and secondary education were more important for poverty reduction. Public spending on agriculture as a share of agricultural GDP in many sub-Saharan countries at 4% was significantly lower than that of the transforming economies in East and South Asia, which spent 10% during the agricultural growth spurt in the 1980s. Lower investments affected the availability of skilled human capital in African agriculture. There are only 42 researchers per 1 million persons economically active in agriculture in Africa. Similarly, in extension, it has been estimated, sorry, it's the wrong slide, uh, that there is around one extension agent for 30,000 farmers in Mozambique, though the situation is better in Tanzania. The enrollments in agricultural higher education are much lower than overall tertiary enrollments. I'll just take examples from three countries, Ghana, Kenya, and Malawi. In Ghana, they constitute 4.3% of all tertiary enrollments, while in Kenya, it's 7.4%, and in Malawi, 15.4% of the total share of tertiary enrollments. Today, Africa is the youngest continent on the planet with the need for more education and training opportunities. Now, the situation in Asia is not very different. A government report in India points out that while the targeted training capacity by 2022 is 20 million, the present system has less than 2 million uh, places per year for training. Singh points out that while India produced 24,000 graduates during 2010, the projected requirement is 54,000 annually by 2020 which requires a two-fold increase in institutional capacity. Will it be possible for governments to achieve this? As Philip Altbach, an uh, expert in higher education, points out, you need 700 million US dollars to build a large research-intensive new Chinese university. How many developing countries will be able to invest such resources, and what are the options? In the previous decade, we have seen an unprecedented demand for higher education. In 2007, there were 150 million tertiary students globally. We find that the numbers have increased to 165 million in 2012, and the estimate is that this is expected to rise to 263 million by 2025. Now, what does this mean in real terms? If we are to accommodate the children who will reach enrollment age, between now and 2025, we will need to build four new universities every single week with a capacity of 30,000. Now, is this a realistic option? In which ways can technology help? 
as governments and policymakers seek to expand access to education, reduce costs and improve standards, it is clear that alternative approaches are needed. And especially in the current economic climate, traditional brick and mortar institutions will not be enough. Let us look at the four responses to the growing demand for affordable quality education. This rising demand for higher education gave rise to a new type of provider, the distance education institution. The success of the Open University UK captured the imagination of policymakers around the world, but particularly in developing countries, and we saw a range of open universities coming up in developed and developing countries. When the Open University UK was established in 1969, the notion of openness was a significant innovation. Lord Crowder, the founding chancellor of the Open University of the UK, made a statement of openness in relation to people, places, methods, and ideas. And this forms the basis of throwing open the ivory towers of higher education. Open universities were oriented towards the massification of higher education. Many open universities do not insist on entry qualifications, allow learners to accumulate credits at their own pace and convenience, and are flexible enough to allow learners to choose the courses they wish to study towards their qualifications. If you look at the growth of open universities in the Commonwealth, in 1988, there were only 10 open universities in the Commonwealth. 25 years later, and you can see this here with the red dots, the number of open universities has tripled. So why are open universities so popular? One reason is lower costs. A study by the National Knowledge Commission India shows that mega universities, and mega universities was a term coined by Sir John Daniel to uh, signify those institutions which have an enrollment of more than 100,000 students. So any university with more than 100,000 students enrolled is a mega university. So obviously they achieve economies of scale, and these are four mega universities uh, in the developing and developed countries, and you can see that uh, putting a student through Alama Iqbal Open University in Pakistan costs 22% of what it would cost to put them through a campus institution. In China, 40%, India, 35%, and in the British Open University, 50% as compared to campus universities, and that's because, you know, the uh, percentages uh, fluctuate because of technology um, uh, use in different uh, jurisdictions. So what about quality? In 2012, the Open University of the UK ranked first in student satisfaction among 100 UK universities. In addition, the Open University UK ranked fifth among the 100 universities surveyed by the Quality Assurance Agency in the UK and was one rank higher than Oxford University. Now, the agricultural education sector has been slow to take advantage of open and distance learning, which can increase access, improve quality, and cut costs at the same time. However, there are examples. In India, the Yashwant Rao Chavan Maharashtra Open University started the School of Agricultural Sciences in 1993 and has continually maintained its certificate, diploma, and bachelor degree programs in horticulture. The Indira Gandhi National Open University launched its School of Agriculture in 2005 and offers certificate and diploma as well as doctor programs. Now, my own organization, the Commonwealth of Learning, as kind of, you know, helps universities to improve their extension activities. It supports a lifelong learning for farmers program in seven Commonwealth countries in partnership with universities, mostly agricultural departments. Using basic mobile phones, women goat herders in India have generated assets worth $9 for every single dollar invested. Likewise, you can see that in Kenya and Uganda, the farmers who have taken part in this project are now ha have access to two meals a day and are able to send their children to school. 
In Uganda, the program is offered in collaboration with Makarere University in the local language using basic mobile phones. And as the World Watch Institute concludes, and I quote, because L3F Uganda adopts, adapts its educational tools to fit farmers' lifestyles and technological capacities, rather than imposing costly or time-intensive educational programs on farmers, the project can make real advances in empowering farmers and improve, improving their livelihoods. Now, what was new in open education was that learning could take place without a teacher and self-instructional materials were developed to cater to the diverse needs of the learners. There was a greater use of radio and television to supplement print materials and the learner could learn at her own pace and place and time. With more access to technologies, there is an increasing trend towards online learning, especially in the developed countries. In fact, in 2013, you can see that almost all public and private universities in the US offer online courses. In 2013, over 33% of all higher education students were taking at least one online course, and you can see this growing trend. So the next question you'll ask is, what of quality? Over 80% students find the quality of online courses comparable to face-to-face -face learning, and in some cases, rated it even as superior. About costs, a survey shows that online education can bend the cost curve, and here again, I think economies of scale can have a major role to play. What about developing countries? After North America, Asia has the highest growth rate, with developing countries like Myanmar, Thailand, and Malaysia leading the continent in e-learning. Just to give you a flavor, Open University of Malaysia has over 90,000 online students, and Malaysia is not a very big country, like India or Nigeria, for instance. Mumbai University enrolls nearly 80,000 online learners. There's also a significant number of online learners in industry-based IT courses, which are re recognized towards employment. Just to give you one example from Guelph University, Canada, like many other institutions, offer online courses in agri agriculture. And the certification is based on performance in online quizzes and participation in discussions. Now, online courses brought in innovations such as authoring tools, learning management systems, unlimited web resources, and online self-tests, which introduced a greater scope for interactivity. Interactivity is a key aspect with a higher level of personalization through the use of ICTs. This led to more flexible and blended approaches, and many campus-based institutions began to offer both face-to-face -face and distance learning programs, thereby opening up access to newer constituencies. Let us look at the third trend. With the rise of social media, there has been a global movement towards collaboration in the development and sharing of content, and we have seen the rise of open education resources, and this has happened in the last 15 years. In 2012, in collaboration with UNESCO, Paul organized the World OER Congress in Paris, which came up with 10 recommendations which were adopted by more than 70 countries uh, from the world. The fundamental principle is that any materials developed with public funds should be made available free to others. As we know, education, edu OER are educational materials which are free, freely available. They can be reused, repurposed to suit different needs and can be available in any medium, print, audio, video, digital. The key difference between OER and other educational resources is that OER have an open license which allows people to adapt and reuse without having to request the copyright holder. So what are the benefits of OER? Evidence from various institutions suggests that OER can cut costs increase access and improve the quality of education, and I'll give you one or two examples. In the US, under the Utah Open Textbooks project, an OER-based textbook can cost $5, dollars, 
and if it is accessed online, it can be entirely free. In fact, uh, where we are located in the province of British Columbia, they have a textbook zero project in which the government has provided funds for developing open textbooks which are available free. And our chair comes from Alberta. Alberta, Saskatchewan, and BC have a uh, joint collaboration on developing OER. Robinson et al. found that students who used open textbooks scored 0.65 points higher on standardized science tests than those using traditional textbooks. What about agriculture? The Jinping Key um, project of the China Ministry of Education has published agricultural learning materials from 259 undergraduate courses online in Mandarin. These are open for browsing but do not carry an explicit open license. Similarly, the National Agricultural Innovation Project in India has led to the production of course materials of 475 undergraduate courses covering six core areas of agricultural sciences. This very large resource in digital format is online but does not have an open license. There's clearly a strong need for concerted efforts to advocate for OER in agriculture, to build capacity among faculty to produce online learning materials and to publish them using an open content license. And why is content important? Why is quality content important? Professor Bob Bernard of the Educational Technology Group at Concordia University, Montreal, and his colleagues carried out a meta-analysis of hundreds of studies in which distance education students were treated in different ways. They distinguished three types of interaction, student content, student student, and student teacher. They then analyzed all the studies to find which type of interaction made the greatest difference to student performance when it was increased. The results were very clear. Increasing student content interaction had much the greatest effect, with student-student interaction coming next, and student-teacher interaction last. This highlights the importance of content. Now, what implications does this have for pedagogy? The student content relationship with a focus on networks and collaboration led to the term connectivism. The emphasis is now on collaboration rather than competition, and the learner's role becomes more significant as she marks a shift from being a consumer to a producer of content. Let us now come to the fourth and final trend, the massive open online courses or MOOCs which are nothing else but a form of distance and online learning. A major consortia of top universities on both sides of the Atlantic have led to the you know, high profile of this movement. If we are to review the MOOCs offered worldwide, how many MOOCs do we find in agriculture? My colleagues did a quick count, and of the 3,600 the uh, MOOCs in general discipline areas, mostly engineering, there were only 1% MOOCs in agriculture. Now, one of the com uh, common objectives for adopting MOOCs in developing countries is to democratize access to higher education. The Malaysian minister has encouraged institutions to leverage new technologies such as MOOCs to democratize access to higher education. The Indian government also wishes to use MOOC platforms to reach the unreached segments of societies, such as working class people and housewives. So MOOCs have so far been offered in higher education. Call offers MOOCs for development, MOOC for D, with technology options that work within low bandwidth scenarios in developing countries and provide off-learning lear uh, offline learning possibilities. And I'll give you an example. Uh, there is a need for MOOCs to build awareness among farmers about essential practices that are sound ecologically and economically. To understand the perception and views of leaders of agricultural education and the research community, Call organized a brainstorming event at the National Academy of Agricultural Sciences India on the viability of MOOCs in agriculture. 
the overwhelming opinion was that MOOCs were viable in agricultural education and training and must be adopted. Paul has offered two MOOCs covering students and faculty in agricultural universities as well as smallholder farmers in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. The MOOC for gardeners is very interesting. This was done in India. It's a bit unique because a gardener or Mali is a semi-skilled farmer who normally owns little by way of land and water assets. This group of farmers contribute much to horticultural and floricultural production. Since this group has practically no access to the internet and is likely to be unfamiliar with online learning, Paul's partner, the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, built a complete suite of MOOC technologies to enable access to learning using a basic voice-only cell phone. The content of this MOOC comprised sets of audio clips on farming practices. A key aspect of this course was the availability of a call center operated by the course team. A comprehensive survey of learners showed that most of them were between 25 to 29 years. Their education level was mostly limited to secondary school. And the learners ranked the content as high quality and relevant. Learners particularly appreciated the conciseness of the lessons and the clarity of the voice and weekly quizzes. Now MOOC marks yet another shift in teaching and learning by putting greater responsibility on the learner to construct knowledge and to move from teaching a small class to a massive group around the world. Will MOOCs transform the way we teach and learn? A significant difference is the emergence of the flipped classroom as the standard practice. This is nothing new for distance educators because they were doing that before. But there is a greater emphasis on peer-to-peer -peer learning, which perhaps distance education was not doing. The use of learning analytics, a component of the MOOC platform, can help us to collect and analyze data about how learning is taking place. Because of this, predictive systems can be developed to identify potential dropouts and provide the necessary support to help them overcome their difficulties. It can also highlight those areas where many students struggle so that the tutors get the feedback to take remedial measures in time. So as we have seen, distance and online learning have grown and evolved over the last 50 years, keeping pace with and taking advantage of the various technologies. Distance and online learning have also opened up access to millions of learners and are a viable option for addressing issues of access, costs, equity, and quality. What then is the way forward for agricultural higher education in the 21st century? Non-traditional educational models supported by developments in technology will definitely have a major role to play. Now, what are the emergent trends in technology? The recent Horizon report estimates that in the next two years, blended learning, which is face-to-face -face and distance, would be used increasingly and institutions will redesign their learning spaces. Over the next three to five years, the focus will shift to measuring learning outcomes and open education resources will be available in more subject areas and hopefully in agriculture too. From technology perspectives, adaptive learning technologies and the Internet of Things would be visible in educational practices. Yesterday we spoke of and I've summed up how knowledge is multiplying at a rapid pace. Has the curriculum changed to keep pace with these developments? Are we harnessing emerging technologies to support teaching and learning? Are we giving our youth the skills they need for employment and entrepreneurship? While professional education such as engineering and medical education are rapidly adopting distance and blended learning, agricultural education institutions in developing countries are yet to optimize the opportunities and models that technology provides. The following steps can be considered, and I would suggest four things. First, agricultural universities can adopt open and distance learning and online provision. 
By becoming dual mode, campus-based institutions can offer two streams of provision that provide flexible options to learners who can study at their own pace, place or time. In this case, open and distance learning can supplement and complement rather than replace existing institutions and provisions. Two, when making this transition, policymakers would need to take a holistic approach. Rather than introduce open and distance learning as an add-on, there would be a need to review existing policies and systems to integrate the approach for optimal efficiency and effectiveness. It would be important to develop quality assurance processes so that the credibility and integrity of the system is maintained. One key dimension would be capacity building uh, of all staff to take ownership of open and distance learning and to contribute to its effective delivery. Three, open and distance learning and online provision can contribute to the ongoing professional development of the agricultural community and institutional pers personnel as well as provide opportunities for lifelong learning in this critical sector. And finally, agricultural universities can embrace openness in a systematic manner. This would include adopting and adapting OER, as well as open access policies for sharing and collaborating on research locally and globally. As the international community gets ready to adopt the Sustainable Development Goals in September this year, the agriculture education community will need to adopt non-traditional and innovative approaches for human resource development if goal two of the Sustainable Development Goals, which aims to end hunger, achieve food security, and improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture is to be achieved by 2030. And with that, thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much.